Today we're going to talk about cell growth and reproduction. In 1858, the German physician Rudolf Virchow stated that all cells come from other cells. It seems such a simple and obvious statement, but in its time it was quite revolutionary. Today we know that cell division is the basis for the continuation of life. We know that when cells reach a certain size, they divide. For many years, however, scientists did not know what caused a cell to begin to divide. Now we know that the outer surface of a cell grows more slowly than the volume of the material inside the cell. Scientists call this surface to volume ratio. When the surface of a cell is no longer large enough to let in the proper amount of food and let out waste, cell divides. The two smaller cells have a larger ratio of surface to volume and are able to function better. When a cell is ready to divide, it is called a parent cell. The two new cells produced as a result of cell division are called daughter cells. Each daughter cell should be identical to the parent cell it comes from. Before we continue further, I want you to remember a few things. Please remember that living organisms have two types of cells. Somatic cells, body cells, soma means body, and gamete cells, sex cells. Those cell types reproduce somewhat differently. First, we will learn about somatic cell division. Division of body cell is essential for body growth and tissue repair. This division consists of two major stages. Mitosis, a division of nucleus, and cytokinesis, a division of cytoplasm. I hope you all remember that nucleus is the main control center of a living cell, and cytoplasm is all material within a living cell, excluding the nucleus. Before I continue with the lecture, I would like you to take a look on your own at all the stages of mitosis and cytokinesis. But before we'll do this, I want to remind you a few details about uh, what you're going to see uh, on the diagrams. And here's the elements that I want you to rem keep in mind while we're going to discuss the topic. I hope all of you remember that a cell membrane is a thin membrane, a double layer of phospholipids enclosing the cytoplasm of the cell. Proteins, a membrane control passage of ions in and out of the cell. Nucleolus, a small, dense, spherical structure in the nucleus of a cell. It is concerned with producing and assembling the cell's ribosomes. Basically, the nucleolus is just a part of the nucleus. The nucleus is the main part of the cell, while the nucleolus is part of the nucleo nucleus itself. The nucleolus is an unorganelle that lack a membrane. Chromatin is the material that makes up a chromosome that consists of DNA and protein. The major protein in chromatin are proteins called histones. They act as packaging elements for DNA. The reason that chromatin is important is that it is pretty good packing trick 
to get all the DNA inside the cell. So what you're going to see now is the mitosis and cytokinesis. I am not going to make any comments on this. I want you to pay attention and see what actually happens. Please pay attention to the details of the process. It's all going to be represented by uh, diagrams. Before we go any further, we should make it clear that mitosis refers to the duplication and division of the nucleus and of the chromosomes, while cell division, also known as cytokinesis, refers to the actual division of one entire cell into two daughter cells. During mitosis, a uh, nucleus divides to form two nuclei. Each nucleus has the same kinds of number of chromosomes as a parent or original cell. In a single cell organism, mitosis results in two uh, new organisms. In multicellular organism, mitosis increases the number of cells. For example, if you uh, cut your skin, cells begin to divide to fill in the cell cut. When the surface of your skin is healed, cell division stops. Now, in, in the nucleus, the chromosomes, which contain the encoded genetic information for the cell, must make a copy themselves before cell division begins. The chromosomes are made up of material called chromatin. During the early stages of cell division, the chromatin condenses and become visible. The copied and now visible chromosomes are called chromatids. Each pair of chromatids is held together by a centromere. Although the centromere can be located at any place on the chromatid, it is usually located in the uh, center uh, near, the, near the middle. In order to make sure everything is copied exactly and divided evenly uh, between daughter cells, a series of four phases occurs in the nucleus. Here are those stages. Prophase, the first stage of mitosis. Metaphase, the second stage of mitosis. Anaphase, the third stage of mitosis. And telophase, the last stage of mitosis. The first phase that occurs in mitosis is called prophase. During prophase, the longest of the phases, chromosomes are formed when chromatin coils. Also, both the membrane that surrounds the nucleus and the nucleolus break down. The centrioles, more dark bodies, separate and move towards opposite ends or poles of the cell. A structure made of microtubules forms between the centrioles. This structure is called spindle. And centrioles play a very important role in uh, organizing the spindle. The spindle fibers. Here you see cell in a prophase. What you see that chromatin is coiled here. The nucleus started to disappear. You see it's not disappeared yet. Eventually on the end of the prophase it will disappear. Right here. This nuclear membrane, right? So nucleolus still be inside. It didn't disappear anywhere yet, right? But on the end of prophase, it will not be there. Now, centrioles appeared. And look, spindle is also formed, right? So this is a typical cell in a prophase. Now, here how it happens. Prophase, chromatin coils. Now becomes chromosomes. New, new, nuclear membrane disappear. Here we see centrioles and uh, asters and spindle formed, all made of microtubules. And here centrioles move to the opposite poles of the cell, the middle of the cell called equator, right? And the opposite sides of the cell called the poles, opposite poles. 
Now, eventually, the spindle that is made of microtubules here is you see the part of it will help eventually chromosomes to move to the opposite uh, uh, sides of the cell. Incidentally, in some fungi and protozoa, the nuclear membrane does not break down during mitosis. Uh, what happens, it pitches into two daughter nuclear membranes near the conclusion of cell division. In metaphase, chromosome lined up along the equator, the center of the cell. Here you could clearly see them right in the middle of the cell or equator of the cell. In this diagram, you can see that in metaphase, the chromosomes are brought to the well-defined plane in the middle of the mitotic spindle. Now, chromosome br brought up to the equator of the cell by the microtubule spindle fibers attached to each chromosomes at the uh, specific site known as the spindle fiber attachment site or centromeres. Here they are, right in the middle. Anaphase is the third phase of mitosis. During anaphase, the centromene that holds the paired chromosomes, sister chromosomes together, splits. The single chromatids move away from the uh, equator towards the poles. The last stage of mitosis is called telophase. And as you can imagine, everything here now happens opposite to the prophase phase. Prophase, and that is the spindle and centrioles disappear. The nuclear membrane forms around each new masses of chromosomes, and the nucleus reappears. I'm sorry, and the nucleolus reappears. The chromosome uncoils and becomes thread like chromatin. Now the cell has two nuclei. We refer to that cell as binucleated cell. Here's this event. In animal cell, cytokinesis occurs by a process known as cleavage. The first sign of cytokinesis is appearance of cleavage furrow as a hollow groove in the cell. On the cytoplasmic side of the furrow, is the contractile ring of actin, microfilaments associated with molecules of the protein myosin. The ring of microfilaments is like a pooling of drawstrings. It splits cells into half. Here on this diagram, you can actually see the cleavage furrow that appears. And this is the sign, as I said, cytokinesis. As you know, in plant, as you know, plant cells have cell wall. Therefore, cytokinesis in plants occur differently. There are no furrow cleavage uh, occurs there. Instead, there is a cell plate appears that's going to grow and divide cell into two cells, as you could see from this diagram. So here is the end of cytokinesis in plant cells. Here I want to tell you an interesting detail about study of, centriol, of centrioles. You see, in recent years, the role of the centrioles in organizing the spindle has been questioned. It has been noted, for example, that flowering plants, which lack centrioles, have perfectly good spindles. It has first been noted that all organisms that have flagelli and or cilia also have centrioles. So someone came up with a counter hypothesis for centriola function. The centrioles, it was suggested, are only seeds that give rise to basal bodies and flagella. I want you to remind what basal bodies are. Basal bodies are unpaired centrioles that um, uh, actually anchor uh, flagella and cilia. Uh, basal bodies are also play role in movement of uh, cilia and flagella. So 
if the hypothesis is correct, why do the centrioles migrate to the future poles of the spindle? Perhaps it is merely a way to ensure that each daughter cell gets one. It turned out that the new hypothesis what was short-lived. In laboratory, preparations of tubulin subunits taken from cells in uh, early mitotic prophase, microtubules would not form unless intact centrioles were added. When the centrioles were added, beautiful esters, radiating clusters of microtubules form around them. So it seems centrioles do organize asters and spindles after all. It is now believed that even flowering plants have something like spindle uh, or, or organizers. But this uh, happen to be amorphous or shapeless structures that are not easily seen with uh, light or electro or even electron microscope. All of the stages, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and the events to the stages might seem like an overwhelming thing to do, to uh, memorize all the events. But you don't really have to just memorize it. Look, if you understand the process, it is very easy to remember it. So you don't have to sit and try to remember everything. So how do you understand these things? Well, think, cells has to divide. So what has to happen to the uh, nuclear membrane? The main thing of this vision is movement of genetic information in even amounts to opposite sides of the cell, right? Opposite sides of the cell, it is moving. Now, so what has to happen? the nuclear membrane has to disappear because otherwise it's going to be on the way of this movement, right? Now, nucleolus, this, uh, uh, that, uh, where the ribosomes are formed and stored, right? It's, there is no need for it now. So it has to disappear and it indeed disappears. The chromatin that was there before all like this tangled together or looked like it's tangled together. Well, it certainly will tangle if it's gonna move simply on opposite sides of the, um, of the uh, cell. Uh, now, so uh, that's a very long structures, uh, chromatin. So it has to coil, right? and the small structures such as the chromosomes forms. So now it's easy evenly to move them evenly to each of the uh, poles of the cell, right? Without making mistakes. So therefore the chromosomes form. And what will help to move the chromosomes? Microtubules, the spindle will help it to move them, right? So what happens, they're going to move to opposite, opposite end of the cells. And if you see finger, it looks like finger-like structures under the microscope. We're going to see it, actually. I'm going to show you the real picture under the microscope, right? So chromosomes are moving and spindle helping them to do it. But what is organizing those microtubules of the spindle is the centrioles. So here, yes, we will need the structures, centrioles, right? And uh, in most of the textbooks, they used to write down that centrioles do not exist in the plant cells. Uh, well, the structures analogous to them exist in flowering plants. Indeed, as we learned from the uh, previous slides, right? It's just not very visible under the light microscope and uh, electron microscope. So they are indeed very important centrioles in cell division, especially in organizing microtubules of the spindle, right? In metaphase, what has to happen? The chromosomes, in order to be evenly distributed, they have to line up, right, in one line like a soldier's on the equator of the cell. And that's what happens in metaphase. 
right here. And then they are moving in anaphase, right? As I said, if you see the fingers like this, finger-like structures, uh, right? Um, on the, the microscope, that is anaphase. Here is they're moving. The uh, chromosomes are moving uh, away from the equator towards the opposite poles, or sister chromatids, we can call them, or chromatids, we can call them at this point, right? We don't say the uh, chromosomes, we say chromatids, they are moving. Now, what is the next thing has to happen? The cytoplasm has to split, right? But before cytoplasm split, actually, everything has to appear back, such thing as nuclear membrane right the chromosomes they uncoil and be, be become chromatin nucleolus appears right here you could see right and usually at the same time the cleavage four appears in the animal cell right in the plant cell it's going to be a pl uh, plate cell plate formed in between the cells but here's a four of four of cleavage four occurs and the cell literally will be split into two by moving because there will be actin and filament um, and myelin i'm sorry actin and myosin two different types of proteins that move going to move and the cell like a belt is going to be split into two cells and here we have the cell and cell daughter cells right we had a parent cell and on the end we ended up and ended up with two daughter cells now the daughter cells are, are identical to the parent cell you have to remember one thing that is very important right what do i mean identical it has exactly the same number of chromosome as the parent cells in human cells it will be 46 chromosomes okay so parent cell had 46 chromosomes and the daughter cells also have 46 chromosomes they are uh, that's why they are identical except the size the size will be a little smaller but those cells are going to grow and a reach of the size of the parent cell eventually. Now take a look again at the process of mitosis and cytokinesis. Please read the statement above. So let's practice a little bit. I want you to find an anaphase on the slide of the uh, tulip root tip. Here is many cells, as you could see. You see the purplish. Uh, uh, structures are nucleus and chromosomes. Keep this in mind. Now look at this slide and find anaphase. Where is anaphase? Put pause on this video until you find it. Here I hope you all found it. Here you could see late anaphase right here. And here is anaphase. Some of the part of it been cut off, I think during dissection, um, making slide. Now I want you to find metaphase on the slide. Please press pause on the video until you find it. Here you can clearly see the metaphase. Chromosomes are right on the equator of the cell. Here is one cell and here is another cell. You see chromosomes are lined up on the middle of the cell. If you see these structures right in the middle, that means it is metaphase right in the middle. How about finding prophase? Please click pause on this video and find the prophase. Here it is. 
Was it hard to find? Well, what you see, how do you know it's a pro face? First of all, a cell is fairly large, so perhaps this is not a daughter cell, right? So now what you see here also is uh, the uh, chromatin coils, it's become condensed. Compare this cell, for example, with this cell. Look at this cell, you cannot see chromatin. You could see nucleoli though. You see dark two uh, little dots here, dark dots here. Those are nucleoli, larger and smaller one here. Do you see any nucleoli here? No, they disappeared, right? They already disappeared and chromatin condense or chromatin coils here. And that's very striking. Do we have any other prophase? Or perhaps this cell in a prophase also, right? These cells, perhaps mm, they are in a, either in a prophase or it could be uh, when chromatin perhaps uncoiled, if this is a daughter cell, right? So if chromatin is uncoils here and um, uh, becomes chromatin, but I will bet on the prophase because again, the cells are fairly large in here. They're not small one. So they don't look like a daughter cells. Now I want to bring your attention to karyotype. Hope you all remember that karyotype is the chromosomal constitution or chromosomal number of an organism. Like for example, in each of our human somatic cells, we have how many chromosomes? 46 chromosomes. Okay. In each our sex cells, in females, it would be eggs, and in males, it's going to be sperm cells. We have 23 chromosomes. You see half of the number of somatic cells. This is important. We get 23 chromosomes from our father, and we get 23 chromosomes from our mother. Now, the full number of chromosomes that we have, we call diploid number. Abbreviation for diploid number is 2N. DI stands for 2. So diploid number abbreviation is 2N. Now the half number of the chromosomes that we find in the sex cells we actually symbolize as N and we refer to it, to it as a haploid number of chromosomes. So diploid number of chromosomes in humans is 46, haploid is 23. Now let's take a look at the karyotypes, what you see of different animals. You see dogs have karyotype is 78, chimpanzees is 48, potato has same as chimpanzees, 48, but it is, doesn't mean that potato is closely related to chimpanzees. You see that the karyotypes doesn't show us how organisms are related to each other. And the number of chromosomes doesn't mean if the organism has more chromosomes, that it is more uh, uh, complex or more developed organisms. As I said, some ferns and some crabs, they might have up to thousand chromosomes the karyotype is pretty large. Uh, so here, right, a look at the cat, 38, dogs 78, right? Mosquito has six, and is set in uh, six cells of mosquito, there is three chromosomes, you see. All right, so I hope that is clear, right? What is hyploid, what is diploid, and how we abbreviate it. This is, would be important for us to keep in mind. The diagrams that I am about to show you now actually summarize this major event of cell division. So now we're going to take a look at the bigger picture of the cell division. Look, what you see here is the parent cell that is about to 
divide, right? Let's start with the parent cell. Of course, you see the cytoplasm is inside, right? Cytoplasm is everything inside the cell except the nucleus. Nucleus is here. And look at the numbers that we talked about. 2N now becomes 4N. Aha, uh -huh, what is 4N? 2N means diploid number of chromosomes. And 4N will refer to as tetraploid number of chromosomes. Tetra means four in Latin, right? So 2N, a diploid number of chromosomes, double up and becomes tetraploid number of chromosomes. Notice, this happens before mitosis. We call this a phase interface, and we will uh, talk about interface in a bit from now. But now look, so when the cell is in mitosis, it is the, the number of chromosomes, the tetraploid there already. So what does this mean, tetraploid number of chromosomes? Let's take a look at the human cells. Our diploid number is 48, as you remember, or four, sorry, 46, as you remember. 48 is chimpanzees and potato, right? So our number is 46. That is, uh, and what happens, it doubles up. So it becomes 98. Our tetraploid number becomes 98. Yes, when cell enters mitosis, it has 98 chromosomes. Why you will say that's necessary? Why the chromosomes doubling up? Well, because the daughter cells will have to have how many chromosomes? 46. So if there is no doubling up, the daughter cells are going to have 23 chromosomes, right? Perhaps in this case. So we, the, the number of chromosomes has to double up. And that's what happens before mitosis in interface. Okay. So now look what happens here. We say this is a big picture, right? Then what happens? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Boom! Cell is in telophase. It's binucleated becomes. Binucleated. In each nucleus, we have how many chromosomes? 46 chromosomes if it's a human cell. Now, look what happened. Cleavage occurs. Cell goes into cytokinesis. The cell still be tetraploid, right? Even though in each of the nucleus we have 46 chromosomes, but it still be the whole cell is one cell. And then cell splits into a daughter cells. And each of the daughter cells has diploid number of chromosomes. So each of them has 48 chromosomes. That's why we need chromosomes become tetraploid before the cell divides. I hope that is quite clear. If you answer this simple question, that means everything I said was clear to you. Please try to answer it. Here's the answer. I'm not going to read it. You can do it on your own. All right. Now we're going to talk about cell cycle. What is the cell cycle? Life of the cell. All the stages the cell has to go. That's what we refer to as cell cycle. And as, as you could see, after mitosis and cytokinesis, cell goes into the, the stage that called interface. Inter means in between, in between mitosis and cytokinesis. A cycle is endless, and the cell cycle is an endless repetition of mitosis, cytokinesis, growth, uh, chromosomal replication, and more mitosis. Well, I will be more specific about the phases of the cycle later, but first I should point out one thing. 
not all cells do it, cycle that is. Also, any cell has innumerable cell cycles in the past, they may have none in its future. Some break out of the cycle, but when they do, they pay dearly. They die. In fact, many specialized cells are actually in a terminal condition. They will live in this state for a time, sometimes a very long time, fulfill some function and pass on to be replaced with newly differentiated cells that have broken out of their own cycles in order to specialize. Fingernail cells, for example, fill themselves with a keratin, a tough water repellent protein, and die. In birds, reptiles, and, fi and fish, the nuclei of red blood cells are present, but they are permanently turned off. So these cells will die without undergoing another division. And of course, the red blood cells of mammals, which have no nuclei, are living on borrowed time. Blood stem cells, the cells from which other blood cells arise, continue to divide, but their daughters may have different fates. One daughter cell can differentiate into a red blood cell, or perhaps into a leukocyte, white blood cell, while another continue to cycle as dividing stem cell. A final example of non-cycling doom cells are the gametes, the eggs and sperm, with an exception of a very few that unite to form a new individual. Of course, if they survive the incredible odds against them, they enter the events of growth, replication, and division once again. There are exceptions. Biology is full of exceptions to the dictum cycle or die. Nerve cells specialize early and some remain alive through the lifetime of the individual. The same is true of skeletal muscle cells and many of the tissue cells of the body. Nerve and skeletal muscle cells formed in invertebrate embryo, once differentiated, are no longer capable of cell division. You are born with virtually all the cells you are ever going to get. Also, such cells don't divide, they are capable of growth. So you have just as many bicep muscle cells as any weightlifter. Point that out to the next one you see. Such function in metabolizing cells are then nevertheless unable to divide and said to be terminally differentiated. In the end, of course, they too die. Many embryonic cells undergo program death, but their, hand, uh, but, but, but their death is part of an organism development. For instance, the human embryonic hand starts as a puddle-like structure. Separate fingers are formed by the death of cells in the spaces between the future fingers. And other cells uh, throughout the body must die to make channels for the blood vessels. I should point out that the number of terminally differentiated cells in any organism depends largely on the species involved. For example, in many adult insects, all cells are terminally differentiated, except for those of the sex cells. Plant tissue uh, have a high proportion of terminally differentiated cells also. At this point, I can uh, begin the discussion of the cell cycle proper. What stages do cycle cells undergo? First, the cell cycle is traditionally divided into four phases. M phase, G1 phase, S phase, and G2 phase. The M stands for mitosis, including cell division. S stands for synthesis of DNA. And G1 and G2 stands for GAP1 and GAP2, respectively. The terms may seem a bit primitive, but they come from an early age. Briefly, in M phase mitosis, the chromosomes condense and nuclear membrane and nucleoli disappear. The mitotic spindle forms, the two identical sister strands of each chromosome separate and go to opposite poles. Two new nuclear membranes and two new sets of nucleoli form, and the cell divides into two daughter cells. The remaining three phases are collectively called interphase. The chromosomes decondense as each new daughter cell enters G1 phase. 
the first stage of interface. This is generally a very active period of the time when the cell synthesizes the enzyme and structural proteins necessary for cell growth. In this stage, each chromosome consists of only a single unreplicated DNA strand with an associated histones and non-histone chromosomal proteins. The S phase is the period in which DNA and chromosomal proteins are replicated. This phase typically lasts a few hours. The G2 phase is simply a period between synthesis and mitosis. The proteins of the mitotic spindle are synthesized in, in this time in preparation for the coming nuclear division. This mitotic spindle is an elaborate structure that is involved in chromosome movement during mitosis. It is constructed anew for each cell cycle, then dismantled after it has been used once. As in G1, the, the cell may be metabolically active and growing. In G2, each chromosome consists of two strands, now called chromatids. The two chromatids of G2 chromosomes are so tightly bound that they cannot be distinguished visibly until they separate during mitosis. The relative amount of time the cell spends in each stage varies greatly from one cell type to another. S phase and G2 can be considered to be preparation for mitosis. Terminally differentiated cells, if they have nuclei at all, are usually frozen in G1 phase. Now let's check your comprehension of the material we covered. So the first question to you, in which stages of the cell cycle does a cell contain a diploid number of chromosomes? Press pause and think about it. If your answer is in G1 phase and on the beginning of S phase, you are correct. This is because on the end of mitosis, the daughter cells have to be identical to a parent cell, except the size. And here is the second question. In which stages of cell cycle does a cell contain tetraploid number of chromosomes? Your answer is correct if you said that on the end of S phase and uh, in the G2 phase. Here's explanation. Since during the mitosis the parent cell will split in half, on the end of S phase the number of genetic material in the cell has to double up. For humans, this means that all parent cells before splitting into two daughter cells will have 92 chromosomes. So let's briefly summarize uh, everything what I was talking about. G1, S and G2 phases are collectively called interface. Remember, inter means in between. In a human body, there is cells that do not undergo cell cycle. They do not divide. If you lose them, you lose them for good. They are in G0 phase. Those cells are neurons, which are brain cells, or also we refer to them as a nerve cells, so better to say neurons, and skeletal muscle cells. We say there is another term we use, we call them terminally differentiated cells. Animals and plants reproduce by sexual reproduction. What does this mean? Well, males produce male sex cells and female produce female sex cells. In males it's sperm and in females eggs. When, this, when the two cells from male and female combine together, they form zygote. Zygote is a fertilized egg. Zygotes start dividing and adult organism is produced. Now that adult organism starts to produce sex cells or gametes. And the cycle closes, right? Then zygote formed again, and then the zygote divides, and another adult organism produced. Another generation is produced. 
Now, gameto, gametogenesis, a production of sex cells. We call this gametogenesis, production of sex cells. There is two types of gametogenesis. Oogenesis, a production of egg. On the egg end of oogenesis, there is one fun functional egg is produced. And then spermatogenesis, a production of sperm in males. On the end, we have four functional cells produced. In higher organisms, both plants and animals, each individual is hyploid. This means that every cell in the organism has, has a double set of genes and chromosomes. One set from a father and one set from a mother. When an individual reproduces sexually, a partner of the opposite sex must be involved. And two partners produce gametes, eggs and sperm if they're animals. We join to produce an offspring. This offspring will receive one set of genes and uh, chromosomes from each of the two parents. So the question to you, are gametes diploid or hyploid cells? Think about it. Gametes are haploid. This is because each parent donates only half of genetic material to an offspring. Thus, you inherit 23 chromosomes from your mother's egg and 23 chromosomes from your father's sperm. Now, to produce these cells with a reduced number of chromosomes, the cells have to go another process called meiosis. Remember, we discussed mitosis, formation of somatic cells. Now we're looking at formation of sex cells. In order for them to be formed, the cells have to go through meiosis. Why do we need to have a num half number of chromosomes? Because if we don't, every generation, the number of chromosomes are going to be increased. That is insane, right? The future, uh, off the offsprings do not need any doubling up of their chromosomes. So that's why the process called meiosis is handy. We can define meiosis as the process whereby I, a, a diploid double set of chromosomes is reduced to a hyploid single set of chromosomes in a cell. In diploid organisms, the process guarantees that the chromosome number will remain stable from generation to generation and that each sexually reproduced offspring will get two complete set of genetic instructions, each set being a random mix taken from the parents' own two sets of genetic instructions. So meiosis is the process of cell division that produces cells with half the number of chromosomes. During meiosis, two nuclear divisions occur. Meiosis 1, which has prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, telophase 1. And meiosis 2, which has prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, and telophase 2. Meiosis is a terribly complicated process, and I usually do not cover uh, meiosis in one lecture for my non-science bio classes. Uh, but a few things I want you to know about this. It is important. The chromosomes behave the same way uh, in my meiosis in males and females, but there are some differences. For example, timing is different in males and females. In males, with every heartbeat, there is a thousand sperm cells is produced. In females, meiosis 1 occurs at puberty, and meiosis 2 occurs only when egg cells become fertilized. And another very important process I want you to understand in meiosis is crossing over. 
Crossing over occurs between prophase 1 and metaphase 1, and it's the process where two homologous non-sister chromatids pair up with each other and exchange different segments of genetic material to form the recombinant chromosome sister chromatids. Crossing over is an important for the normal segregation of chromosomes during meiosis. Crossing over also accounts for genetic variations, because due to the swapping of genetic material during crossover, the chromatids held together by the centromere are no longer identical. So when the chromosomes go on to meiosis too and separate, some of the daughter cells receive daughter chromosomes with recombinant alleles. Uh, allele means a uh, another form of a gene. Due to this genetic recombination, the offsprings have a different set of alleles and uh, genes that their parents do. In the diagram, uh, genes capital B and lowercase b are crossed over with each other, making the resulting recombinants after meiosis, capital A, lowercase b, capital A, capital B, lowercase b, A and lowercase b, and lowercase a and capital B. Meiosis is a major part of sexual reproduction. So what is a sexual reproduction good for in the long run? You probably have an answer about the short run. But let's talk about the long run. In the long run, we are all dead, but our genes live on. When we leave offsprings, we pass our reproductively successful genes on to our descendants. The problem is our descendants may not find the world to be the same as the one we lived in. The weather changes. The diseases show up and unexpected competitors eat our food. Obviously, no one particular combination of gene, including ours, will be adequate to meet all new situations. So according to the evolutionary theory, sexual reproduction comes to the rescue. Sexual, I mean, sexual recombination helps reshuffling the genes of all the successful individuals in the population. So the virtually infinite possibility combinations of genes will be produced. Most of the new combinations will actually be worse than the old ones. That's unfortunate. But in the long run, it is cost of success. The winning evolutionary strategy is to cover as many beds as possible by having highly variable offsprings. Then when the weather changes or the creeping purple flu shows up, perhaps not all of your descendants will be wiped out because some of them are likely to have the right combination of genes to be able to live under these conditions. We can see this principle at work in certain organisms that can reproduce either sexually or asexually. For instance, Daphnia, a little water flea, reproduces asexually from generation after generation. Females produce only females. In fact, sometimes one can see an asexual female embryo within asexual female embryo within an asexual adult. The little animals keep up this kind of reproduction as long as conditions are stable. But when their pond begins to dry or things otherwise get dangerous and unpredictable, they change strategies. <clears throat> they begin to reproduce both males and females. This go on mate and reproduce sexually in the usual way. Thus, when the hard times come, or in the next spring, or in the next rain, a few of the highly variable offspring may have that particular combination of genes that will allow them to cope with the new environment. There are two major take-home lessons from the story of meiosis. First, Meiosis halves the chromosome number of eggs and sperm, making fertilization feasible. 
Second, meiosis provides a means for shuffling and reorganizing chromosomes, thus increasing genetic variation in offspring. This reorganization takes place in prophase one, scrambling of chromosomes through crossing over. In the random lining up of, chromo of uh, homologous chromosomes in metaphase one, so that the maternal and paternal centromeres are randomly distributed to the two poles. In the random distribution of chromosomes into polar bodies, in the random ascendancy of one oocyte in the ovary to begin development while the rest remains frozen in the prophase one, and in the chancy competition of billions of individual unique sperm for a single unique egg. No mentioned the somewhat random way the two sexual individuals meet together in the first place. Very often on the end of this lecture, students ask me about twins. So I decide to elaborate a little bit about this. Twins are two offsprings produced by the same pregnancy. So there is two types of twins, identical twins, or they called monozygotic twins, and fraternal twins that called dizygotic twins. Looking at these diagrams, you perhaps can right away understand why the identical twins are called monozygotic. Why? Because they come from one zygote. Look, we had egg that been fertilized by the sperm that we, the zygote is formed, zygote grows, and all of a sudden it splits in half. So we ending up with two separate individuals. Now, their, their DNA is identical. That's why they look identical, of course, because they have the same genetic information. Look, we have one egg and one sperm. So, uh, therefore, they are identical. In a great majority of the time, they share placenta when they grow. Now, mono means one, zygotic, zygote right so we uh, this this offspring came from one zygote now then another type of uh, twins fraternal twins now fraternal twins also known as dizygotic twins and from the diagram you can tell why because they come from two different zygotes they didn't come from one zygote, right? We had two separate eggs. Each of these eggs being uh, fertilized by a two separate sperm cells, right? And this uh, actually forms different zygotes, which usually grow in a separate placenta. Now, of course, when if one in a case of identical twins, one twin commit a crime, we cannot tell which actually twin committed the crime. If uh, we can, but we can tell by fingerprints. They have different fingerprint prints, same DNA, different fingerprints. So this uh, could be helpful in investigation, right? Of course, in fraternal twins, they will have different DNA. So we're not talking about this. So thank you for all your attention during today's lecture. Uh, we started with mitosis, right? Cell division of somatic cells. Then we talked briefly, very briefly, about very important topic called meiosis. That's how sex cells are produced. Uh, in males, it would be sperm cells. In females, it's egg cells, right? And then eventually we came up to this random topic of twins. So thank you again for your attention. I hope to see you back and goodbye. Thank you.